Hi, we are um, recording this for Diane Poole Heller's Trauma Summit. And this is a bonus for all of you who purchased the package. And uh, what I and Rick, the founders, Nancy DeSantis and Rick Iannucci, founders of Horses for Heroes, um, have put together are some interviews with some of our veterans regarding our concept of post-traumatic spiritual dissonance. So I want uh, Rick to introduce, Jeremy's here with us. Hi, Jeremy. Hello. One of, our, uh, one of the great things that um, we do here in Santa Fe, New Mexico on the Cross Diaries Ranch is we get a chance to work with some amazing um, men and women that become end up becoming beyond just program participants, but they become cadre with us. And um, one of the folks I'm gonna introduce you to now is a uh, United States Marine. Um, currently working uh, in, in the uh, energy industry, um, Major Jeremy Best, United States Marine Corps, and um, he's our newest cadre member. We'd like to uh, talk a little bit. Jeremy, welcome, and how are Jennifer and the kids? So everyone's doing well. We're, uh, we're making it through the lockdown, and uh, we're slowly coming out of it now. Looking forward to more normal times and getting back out to the ranch and, and doing some good work with you guys. Great, we hope to see you next week. Great, great. So um, I wanted to ask you, Jeremy, what was it that attracted, to you, attracted you to our definition of post-traumatic spiritual dissonance? That's a great question, Nancy. So my, my biggest attractor to it is that it's a rebranding of what most veterans consider a very negative uh, acronym being uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, that really resonated with me, uh, the rebranding of that as spiritual disson dissonance, because I truly believe that's exactly what it is. It's not a disorder because veterans are very well known for overcoming just about any obstacle. So there is no disorder that we can't overcome. There's dissonance that we need to make into consonance. And by working with the horses and working with you and Rick, you know, we can turn that dissonance back into consonance and find the peace within. That's great. How, how um, our concept here is that the horse uh, not, not the only thing we do, but the horse is a primary uh, mover here on our ranch. And our, uh, basically our, uh, our mantra, our motto is that the horse is, the, the Lord has given us the horse as a bridge between the physical world and the spiritual world. How did that resonate with you? And how do you find that, 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 that we actually put our action into words or our words into action by using that mantra essentially? Thanks, Rick. Um, so I actually experienced that very, very directly. My first session mm -hmm. uh, coming out working with Nancy and the horses. And I remember very clearly um, being in the round pen, working, just doing energy work and trying to understand where I was in my own head mm -hmm. and connecting with the horse as that guide, that spiritual guide. And uh, there, there was one particular point that I, I recall very vividly where my mind started drifting to other places mm -hmm. as it sometimes does. And we all experience that, but the horse responded immediately. And I, I recall that uh, Nancy immediately called me back and said, where did you go? <laughs> and that don't worry. She says that to me a lot. <laughs> So she saw the response of the horse and connected that I wasn't there anymore, at least, you know, mentally or emotionally. And, and so that sort of helped me realize where I was, what I was doing mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. And I came back to it mm -hmm. and all, all of those things connected at once. And then it, it, it brought a sense of, of wholeness to me right there in the round pen that I then connected and I could feel the energy of the horse and I could feel Nancy and you on the railings and I could feel that. And it just, it sort of transcended our normal experiences 
-hmm. And that was the beginning of what I call the journey. Mm -hmm. And that really, that connection is what you talk about so often in these types of seminars, but that connection was very real for me. And when Nancy noticed immediately, I mean, within a second of my mind drifting and the horse responding, Mm -hmm. she, she recognized that and immediately pulled me back and said, where are you? And that was powerful. And that was, that was a connection between your words and your, your ideology put into reality. And it, it hit me hard. And that really was a big part of the beginning of the journey. And it really connected your philosophy with the reality. Great. So just for our listeners, I wanted to clarify just a little bit. So what Jeremy is speaking of is how I could tell he had disassociated or kind of just left there is because he he went from the body experience to the mind. And the horse wants us as human beings to be physically connected mind, body and spirit. So it was about getting him and then I worked with him to get back in his body and a somatic feeling so that he can, he can have that connection and feel and feel that difference. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is that a good explanation for people? Absolutely. Listening? Okay. Great. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, great. What other, um, how, how long, uh, bef- when you came back from, um, Iraq, um, yeah. Was it before you ended up, I know we met um, basically when we were uh, working with our grass-fed beef uh, and one of our cattle ranchers, one of our program partners, but then it took you a while to come out, finally come out. Can you tell us a little bit about the time you became aware of what we were doing, what was happening with you, and then by the time you came, actually came out, what was happening to you, and then what was it that finally uh, uh, was your uh, motivation to pull the trigger and finally say, yeah, I actually um, need to get, or it might have been a family member, you know, I know Jennifer's an, an, a phenomenal person and can be very persuasive as well. I'm not trying to put yeah. words in your mouth, <clears throat> but maybe you could take us through a little bit of that because that speaks to you understanding that, hey, I have this that, and these guys are get it because they're talking about a spiritual dissonance and they're not uh, labeling this uh, as a disorder, which I don't have. Right. So that's a, that's a perfect, uh, a perfect summary, really. So we did meet uh, whenever I was picking up some beef from one of the local ranchers Mm -hmm. and uh, you, you immediately connected with me and your, your genuine uh, personality really resonated with me and we exchanged business cards and then i i actually went on the website and started kind of looking at at the philosophy and i had always avoided the labels Mm -hmm. and the 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 negative connotation that you know all veterans are crazy and and a little bit off and so i just i really did not like those labels so whenever i saw that you were looking at it from a different perspective I started thinking about it and actually my wife, it was, I think it was a year or two, maybe it was a year afterwards. My wife said, you know, that, that horses for heroes program that we talked about after we picked up the beef, she was like, she's like, maybe it's time. She was like, I really think that you might need to go see what they're doing out there. And when she said that, it kind of hit me like, Oh, yeah, maybe if my wife is telling me I need to go go out and check you guys out, mm-hmm. maybe there's something there that even more than I'm seeing, uh, I'm fairly self-aware, but when my wife tells me, hey, go check this out, <laughs> it kind of hits me pretty hard. And it brings me back to reality that uh, maybe I don't have everything quite wired right. And uh, mm-hmm. it helps, It it always helps to find other people that think the same way that we do Mm -hmm. or think differently and can guide us on a path. And I just felt, I finally felt it was time when she told me Mm -hmm. I should go ahead and take a look at that. It was within the same week that I reached out to you. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I couldn't be happier. This, this journey that, 
you know, we're all on, all of us are on our own journey. Um, but both of you have been amazing in, in helping me, helping guide me through this, this process and just learning a different way to look at things. And the horses are amazing healers and just being able to connect and, and, you know, understand mm -hmm. who I am now regardless of what happened in the past, but who I am now and how to move forward. That's the important part. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Um, I have, let's see what time is here. I wanted to know if you had any particular advice because this recording is going out to um, therapists mm -hmm. and most, a lot of them are yeah. somatic therapists who mm -hmm. work with uh, the body of which we work, you know, it is for us all about the embodiment, right? So, but did you have any kind of advice to therapists coming from your point of view of, of, of therapists working with veterans? Um, yeah, actually, thank you. That's my biggest advice. If I could give any at all, it would be that never approach a veteran as if they're broken or they they've got something wrong with them because even that mindset will will set you back um veterans are people we have experiences just like anyone else and if you approach it from the standpoint that you know maybe there's a little bit of dissonance maybe there's something that they're working with in their own head that they have to come to you. It's not gonna be a forced thing. If they're already in your practice, then they're in the right place. And then it's up to you to gently guide them and just show them. Veterans are very much go-getters. They're, they're forward thinkers and they, they like to, to solve problems. More than anything, veterans are, are trained born and bred to solve problems and so you just sort of look at it from that perspective and they are they are solving their own problems and they're using your services as a way to enable that as a way to to grow and develop so don't ever look at them as if they're broken and you're going to fix them they're going to fix themselves through your practice. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And so those are necessary words. Did you have any? Yeah, other you, you were a commanding officer in a combat unit in a, in a combat zone. And um, yes. uh, as you know, I'm former special forces, former Green Beret, um, a little bit, a little bit older than you, <laughs> but um, uh Nonetheless, we both operated in, in what you and I both know was a very ambiguous environment, especially where I was and where you were. Um, right. Now that you've gotten to this point and this far out of a uh, your service days and on your own journey, can you rewind the tape back to when you were in command and think about the young men under you and um, who were pro possibly experiencing this at the time, and now that you know what you know now, can you can you say, oh, I identified back then what was happening to these guys, this kind of spiritual dissonance? So that's a that's a great lead in. I was in combat in two thousand seven, two thousand eight, with Third Battalion, Second Marines, uh, Marine Corps Infantry, um, and I had. I had a team of 56 guys and we were, we were running convoys and doing all sorts of things. We had uh, roadside bombs, mortars, um, lots of other things happening. And my, my role as their, their commander was mm -hmm. to make sure that they were okay and to watch them. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot that I did to, just pay attention to to my folks make sure they were in the right mental state um, and I dealt with my own issues sort of separately yeah. with some of the other officers um, and a lot of it was just kind of stuffing it down because mm -hmm. my focus was on my people and making sure they were okay I was way more focused on 
my troops than I was on myself. Um, but also keeping in mind that I had to keep myself kind of going and, and aware in order to take care of them. And, and that, that sort of resonates now is, you know, taking care of my family and taking yeah. care of, of my coworkers now that I'm in a different paradigm. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was definitely a challenge and just being, being aware in that moment and being like Nancy says, the full body, the full somatic experience, you sort of do that intrinsically when you're in combat because mm -hmm. you're looking at what's going on, what might happen. You're thinking through all the mm -hmm. scenarios. You're trying to be um, ready to give orders, take, take care of people and watch everything going. And you're, you're kind of on a heightened sense of alert. You're mm -hmm. on 110% every time you leave the wire, every time you go outside of your main camp, you're on 110% and, and you're, it's almost like your senses are tingling the whole time you're out because anything can happen and you need to be ready for it. And that becomes a little bit hardwired mm -hmm. when you do that for long enough. I was deployed for eight months. Mm -hmm. And when you come back, you have to sort of dial that back. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's it's not easy just to turn that off the the hyper awareness but that's one of the things that a lot of veterans have to focus on is is being feeling safe in their own head mm -hmm. and feeling like people actually care about them like i cared about my guys i i still talk to to mm -hmm. my marines who are all they've all moved on to different things different points in their life but they still check in with me and I still check in with them because there's a connection there there's a bond there and a lot of them still come out and say you know you know hey what's going on and how are things and that tells me that I did something right when we were in harm's way mm -hmm. is that my guys still reach out to me and they they still check in on me and I check in on them so I feel like there's definitely a connection there and there's there's a lot of that rewiring working with horses and you guys that it sort of it balances out that hyper awareness with feeling in the moment i feel some of the same things but in a much more controlled and balanced environment with you guys and the horses so it does connect but it's it's very it's a it's a way to accept what happened in Iraq for me and being able to synthesize that in my brain and realize that, you know, what happened happened and I'm moving on from there. And that same sort of awareness, that same mind body melding mm -hmm. that I did without thinking in combat, I can now do consciously with the horses and that transcends to my family and being aware in the moment and it, it just goes all through life and it makes me a better leader and a better person beautiful would you Thank know you. uh some of the therapists that are probably tuned in to to this broadcast um work with family uh family units family therapists or family therapists what advice could you give them to how to deal with the spouses of veterans that are returning from a combat zone or, or or like yourself or a decade out and are now starting to come back in touch with themselves so that's dealing with spouses all i know is what my amazing wife has put up with from me <laughs> she is uh she has endured my uh my journey so to speak um yeah we get that we both married up man i got it <laughs> right so I would, I would just say working with spouses is helping them to understand one, that their spouse is not broken. Mm -hmm. They have some experiences mm -hmm. that they are not broken. And that is the, that, that is the one paradigm. If, if those watching this mm -hmm. could take away anything, I would just say that, you know, combat veterans are not broken. Right. They need a little guidance on their journey, but they are not broken. And so when a spouse looks at their spouse as 
you know, a, a compatriot, a, a, someone to, to help them and be with them on the journey, not to try to fix them, not to try to change them or do anything different, but to facilitate their changing and their journey on their own. Mm -hmm. So working with families, just explaining to spouses, no, your husband or wife or spouse is not broken. They just need compassion and understanding. And yeah, you're going to have to endure a lot of roller coasters because let's be honest, that's kind of what it is. That's what life is in general is a series of roller coasters. COVID is teaching us all that. Oh boy. And, but the biggest thing is just, just ride the wave. You know, you're, you're on the surfboard. Don't give up on them. Don't give up on the ride mm -hmm. because if, if you, if you ride the wave, it will get better. You'll get to shore and mm -hmm. it'll, it'll taper out. And, you know, people find balance in their own ways. So that's, that's the only guidance is to, you know, work with spouses and help them understand their spouse is not broken. They just need some more compassion and they need a little bit of guidance. And again, if they're already in your practice, they're already on the journey. They're moving in the right direction. So they're, if they're in, their, in your practice, they're already starting that. And they just need some, some help facilitating that journey. They don't need to be fixed. They just need some, some guidance. And that's really what I would love for people to take away from this. Well said. Beautiful. Well, well said. said, man. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you for joining us today, Jeremy. And um, we look forward to seeing you real soon, okay? All right. Thanks for having me. <laughs> all right, brother. God bless. Semper Fi. Hurrah. <laughs> Take care, all of you. Thanks.